Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you a second look at some more of the details from the image quality of the new Sigma 14mm f1.8 art series lens. I'm also going to give you my final verdict on the lens here today. So we're going to accomplish a couple of things. We're going to look at coma performance. Um, flare resistance, distortion, autofocus performance, and then of course just a little bit more information on the lens itself and who I think this lens is for. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to jump in and look at a few more aspects of the image quality along with the autofocus performance and by looking at some real world images here. So let's jump in, let's take a look. Okay, we're gonna start by looking at perhaps one of the most important ingredients that a lot of people are looking for here, and that is the coma performance of this lens. So obviously this is a, um, you know, a, a pretty interesting option for doing astro work in that it has that f1.8 aperture at, uh, you know, this wide focal length. And so as a result, obviously there is, and it's a tremendously sharp lens, so there's lots of sharpness. But we're here to look at uh, the actual coma performance. And so, first of all, I do want to say that this image could be obviously focused a little bit better. I, um, with, that's a lack of familiarity with the lens and I thought I had it focused the way that I wanted and I didn't entirely. But there's enough detail here for, to let me know that, of course, we already know that the lens is very sharp, so star points when you have it properly focused at infinity uh, should be nice and crisp. Now, we can see that towards the edge of the frame, this lens is not completely exempt from the coma phenomena. Here we see that there are some you know, wings kind of growing on these star points. And so uh, you definitely can see some com comatic distortion that is taking place here. Uh, I've seen worse than this. Um, I've also seen better than this. And so uh, just to give you a look at the star points. And so here we're at F2. And so we're very close uh, kind of to the limits here. But you can definitely see that there are some wings that have started to grow, which is, you know, one of the symptoms of chromatic distortion. Um, that is our chromatic aberration that is taking place there. Now, that being said, I, I don't think that this is pronounced enough at this kind of, this wide a focal length to be a deal breaker. Um, you know, here's another shot I did just of the, the sky itself. And so you can see here, and this is at f1.8, that, uh, you know, that, that things really for the most part look good. But yeah, you can certainly see that there is some evidence of that coma. It's not as sharply defined because the image is not perfectly focused but um, you can see at the same time that there is a huge amount of light gathering potential here um, and that that's going to make it a tempting option even if there is a little bit of, of coma involved and so here you can see a 15 second um, result at ISO 1600 and as you can see um, even with me adding an S curve in here that's darkening you know the blacks a little bit and you know, maybe doing a little bit of brightening of the star points, but you can see that there's huge light gathering potential and that's gonna make it a really compelling um, lens because it means that you can keep the, the actual noise level down. As you can see here in the black area, our noise level is basically non-existent. And that's because on the 5D Mark IV, I'm using ISO 1600 as a piece of cake. And so that's certainly a, a huge upside when you compare the fact that to get you know a similar amount of light gathering at f2.8 with a, another lens that you would have been more at ISO 6400 to get a similar amount of brightness here. And so certainly interesting to me. Now examining another area of uh, what I certainly consider to be strength for the lens is when it comes to the flare resistance. This can be a weakness for uh, lenses that have a circular front element. It certainly is a weakness of the Tamron 15 to 30 millimeter f2.8 that I often use as my wide angle option of choice. And so here we can see, however, that despite that bulbous front element, we've got fantastic flare resistance here at f1.8. No good detail on the area that I focused on here, but the sun being right there in the frame has not caused us any damage here. And so then uh, stop down to f11. That gives you a little bit of a look at the 
uh, the pattern, kind of the sun star or sunburst effect that's going to come off of the lens when it's stopped down at f11. We can see that there is a very slight ghosting that's taking place here. A little bit of veiling right here, but I mean, and here's another little stray light artifact here, but none of these things are in any way, shape, or form uh, deal breakers here. They are pretty insignificant. This is a very strong performance and an area I've been very impressed with. So I also wanted to take a look at distortion. And so here we have a line that should be, you know, perfectly straight. And um, it's, it's not perfectly straight, but at the same time, there's not a tremendous amount of distortion. Up towards the edge of the frame here, we can see that there is uh, kind of some keystoning effect. And obviously, uh, it's keystoning effect with a wide angle lens is going to happen in this kind of situation um, unless you have the, the sensor perfectly level with what you're trying to shoot. Now, uh, in this case, I wanted to just kind of demonstrate if you apply a profile correction and then you just, you know, straightened up the lines. This is just done quickly in Lightroom. I think that the end result is fairly credible here. So you can see there is vignette that has been lifted and there is, um, you know, some correction of distortion that's taken place here. So I think that there are, number one, I do think that there are better options for shooting architecture. I mean, obviously nothing is going to beat an actual tilt shift lens for this kind of situation. At the same time, I, I, I see no reason why if you purchase this lens to not use it in architectural work. I think that, you know, what, you know, distortion is there is correctable and, you know, isn't the end of the world. Now, this is an interesting image here because I actually used a, um, a speed booster or an accelerator here. And this is actually shot on APS-C on a Sony mirrorless and uh, a 6500, but I used a Velo accelerator adapter. And so what it does is it changes the, um, you know, the framing back to that similar of a, of a full frame um, body. And of course it, it also um, opens up the maximum aperture to F1.2. Four. And so anyway, interesting. And, uh, you know, again, uh, the result here is, is certainly useful. And, uh, and so, um, you know, I, I do find that with APS-C noise is a little bit heavier, but at the same time, it's a really nice looking result. Uh, here's a, another, just to give you an idea. And so this is using it in that, that, you know, setting, you know, trying to get lines reasonably straight here, you can see that there is going to be some keystoning perspective type distortion. But again, um, you know, this is a, this is a usable combination. And, and if I own this lens, I wouldn't hesitate to put it to work um, because both that 14 millimeter um, kind of angle of view and of course the, the light gathering potential, the sharpness of the lens, um, you know, I think would make it appealing to some people that would do the uh, real estate or things like that. There's certainly worse options. Now here, I wanted to look at wide um, aperture here, what the lens did in dealing with really hard transition areas. And so this is really where we're looking at the potential for um, some, you know, typical chromatic aberrations, green or purple fringing. And in these areas of really high contrast going from a dark subject to a very light background. And as we look towards, you know, this kind of area here, these are places that are, you know, typical offenders for chromatic aberration. And so the great news is, is that it is pretty much just not there. And in these areas of high contrast, uh, it's doing a great job with that and you know just looking at here even towards the very edge of the frame there's really no true chromatic aberration to be concerned about there so i mean kudos to sigma for doing a great job in controlling that now this is at f1.8 and uh, and so i did note in my last segment number one that there's a lot of sharpness there as you can see at f1.8 that is in completely usable um, I did note that I liked the color and contrast out of the uh, Tamron F15-30 to 30, uh, VC lens that I compared it to. So obviously in this case, I've gone for a mild amount of underexposure to allow me to have full range um, in the sky. But I just wanted to show you that with some post-processing, and of course this is processed to taste, this is you know my work here, but at the same time I wanted you to, to show you that you know it's not the end of the world if you shoot with a lens that doesn't have amazing color pop out of the box if you don't mind doing post-processing because the byproduct of this shot, you know, I've gone from this to this is an image that I think looks 
in my opinion, looks fantastic. And, and so certainly with some work, you can make the colors, you know, pretty Zeiss-like there. Now, I went out purposely to test autofocus after doing some calibration, and uh, there were some of you that were concerned because another reviewer had uh, kind of talked about the unreliability of the autofocus. Uh, frankly, uh, autofocus on a lens this wide, it's not putting nearly as much stress on an autofocus system as a, you know, a narrower angle of view, at, you know, a telephoto type lens. But at f1.8, you know, your depth of field is is more shallow than the typical lens. And so I went out shooting at f1.8 to purposely see if I, you know, could get what I was focused on. And so here, you know, at a, a medium distance here, you can see that, you know, I, I focused for this area here. I wanted that to stand out a bit from the background. And of course the background is not completely defocused here. It is, F, you know, it's a 14 millimeter lens, but we can see that the lens focused where I wanted it to. Uh, similarly here, this is at a much closer distance. And by the way, it's much more close than what this looks like looking at the image. 14 millimeters is a very wide focal length. And so I was really probably within a couple feet of uh, this leaf which was my focus point for here when I shot. And so, as you can see, um, you know, there may be the slightest bit of a front focus here, but by and large, I mean, the, you know, the lens is focused where I wanted. The next shot, I basically just shifted right over and I wanted to focus over here on this. And so going from about a two foot focus distance to a 20 foot focus distance. And as you can see, once again, this is what I would consider a, you know, a well focused result. And so I'm not concerned there. Here, um, you know, this is at a distance of about six feet. And I focused on this branch here, which as you can see, even though there's a lot of things that could have caught autofocus, it has focused very accurately for me there. And, and this shot shows you that at those kind of distances, you can, you know, create a little bit of a three-dimensional effect and, you know, some um, defocused area even at a distance like that. Um, with the wide aperture of the lens. Now here, uh, again, I'm gonna go kind of do kind of a back and forth. I first focus towards the structure itself. And as you can see, that is in focus. I then switched my focus point to this uh, evergreen here in the foreground. And as you can see, it is nice and crisply in focus. And so just toggling back and forth, here's your defocused foreground element. And then here's your defocused background element. That also gives you a look there at the quality of the bokeh a little bit. So after going out and specifically testing it with, and there's a number of other images that I'm not showing you here, I came back without any kind of real reservations about the focus system. Um, it focuses quickly and in my personal experience, at least, you know, limited experience, it seems to focus accurately. So as you can see, this lens really does quite well in a lot of different metrics when it comes to the image quality. And uh, for those of you that are, you know, looking at it, you know, say com compared to the Tamron 15 to 30 for astrophotography, um, obviously the Sigma has better light gathering potential by a fairly good margin, a stop and a third over the uh, the Tamron's f 2.8. And truth be told, light transmission. Although I love this lens, it's going to sound like I'm knocking it right now. I love the lens, but light transmission was not really the strength of this lens. I think that it's actually closer to an f 3.2. In fact, if I throw the Tamron onto an adapter and onto a Sony body, I can only open the aperture up to f3.2, which tells me something there. So, um, you know, I definitely the Sigma has the advantage there. Um, on the other hand, the Tamron actually has lower coma. And so um, if, you're, if coma is a big deal for you, I mean, I think both of these lenses will work well for astrophotography, um, but they both have some different strengths, more light gathering potential here, you know, lower coma on the Tamron. So, you know, good options. And also you need to think about framing as we, we saw in our, comp our previous comparison. And if you missed the resolution test, you can take a look at this video here. But you can see that there's definitely some difference when it comes to the framing between the two lenses. And so the Sigma's 14 millimeter is certainly a fair bit wider than the Tamron's 15 millimeter. Now on the pure, staying here on the astrophotography topic, you know, I, I'm still a, kind of undecided which is the better option. I think in some ways the probably the best option that I've seen so far is still the new Samyang Rokinon Premium Series uh, 14mm f2.4. 
Not quite as much light gathering potential, obviously. It's about two thirds of a stop slower, but really, really low coma. It's also an extremely sharp lens. And so I think it's actually the better Astro lens. That being said, I think that the Sigma is very useful for that. And this is a better performance than some of the Sigma lenses that I've seen. This still is not necessarily Sigma's greatest strength um, in terms of the other things that they correct for optically. You know, and that, that shows up in that this lens does quite well with distortion. I still think the, that the Sigma Zone 12 to 24 millimeter F4 lens has less native distortion. You also have lenses like some of the new things from Laowa that uh, the 12 millimeter F2.8 that has lower native distortion than what this lens does. And so if you're primarily looking at doing architecture or real estate photography, you know, if you're gonna spend this much money, you might as well actually buy a tilt shift lens, which is best suited for that kind of work. But once again, like with Astro, I mean, it's, it's within the wheelhouse of this lens and it can do a good job with that. Sigma's done a fantastic job with chromatic aberration control, as we've seen. It's just, there's basically no real CA for field work. And a vignette is surprisingly low for such a large maximum aperture on a lens like this. So a lot of good stuff there. Flare resistance, I think, is quite exceptional. Again, for a bulbous front element, Sigma nailed it when it came to the flare resistance there. And obviously, the resolution is pretty fantastic from the lens. So a lot of good stuff here. I think maybe that there are kind of two primary obstacles that, that remain, you know, that should be considerations. Uh, one is, is that, you know, to achieve another unique class leading lens when it comes to maximum aperture at a focal length, Sigma had to develop a lens that is pretty heavy. And beyond that, it's quite front heavy. And so while it is physically a bit shorter, um, obviously, than the Tamron 15 to 30, the Sigma is the heavier lens. It is the heaviest lens in the class, heavier even than the uh, Sigma 12 to 24 millimeter F4. And in fact, the only lens really that kind of in, the, in any of the classes around this that is heavier is Canon's 11 to 24 millimeter F4 L lens. And that is only 10 grams or completely negligible um, difference in, in weight. And so you're gonna pay a cost in terms of weight when it comes to this lens. The other way you're going to pay, which is somewhat ironic for a Sigma lens, is in real money. In that this lens is, uh, it ties the 12 to 24 f4 as being the most expensive lens that's, um, you know, outside of a, a super telephoto like the 500 millimeter f4. Um, this is the most expensive lens um, pretty much available from Sigma and ties for the most expensive lens in the art series. We saw a long time in the art series that Sigma kind of had a threshold where all of their products were coming in at at least underneath the thousand dollar mark. That's obviously changed in the last year or so and basically all of the new art series releases in the last year and a half have been north of $1,000. And of course this lens in the US market is $1,600, more like two grand here in Canada. So it's not, a, um, it's not an impulse purchase to be sure. And so I think that for some people they're going to look at other less expensive options simply because of the pure cost of the lens. You know, for example, if you're comparing, you know, looking at both of these lenses, the Tamron, you know, it's a zoom lens and it's got image stabilization and it's about 500 bucks cheaper. And so while it does have a smaller maximum aperture, obviously, you know, that's $500 is a significant sum for some of you. And so, you know, that may come into your consideration process. You also have the extra, you know, the excellent, uh, you know, Samyang Rokinon 14 millimeter F2.4 premium lens that comes in under a thousand dollars. And yes, that doesn't have image stabilization. Or, excuse, or nor does it have um, autofocus, but you know, for the kind of work that you often do with a lens like this, may not be a huge deal for some photographers. So who does this end up being for? I think that this needs to be for those that actually could benefit from having that large maximum aperture. And so for some of you, it is, you're in a situation where you feel like having the larger F1.8 aperture is going to make a big difference for you in doing astral work. And certainly it allows you to keep at a lower ISO setting and keep your shutter speed um, at a more reasonable level. Then I think also there are going to be people that are attracted to this lens that are event or wedding shooters. If you, if you shoot in really dim conditions, um, having um, such a wide aperture, particularly a lens that's very sharp at 
f1.8 will allow you to nail certain shots that you may not in other kinds of situations and uh, you know you have the advantage with a large aperture that you don't with an image stabilizer in that with the larger aperture you can actually keep your shutter speed up without you know driving ISO up too high and that allows you to stop action a little bit better so if you're shooting you know for example um, in lower light uh, for sports or wedding venues or even if you're someone that shoots like in clubs or restaurants uh, this lens could be very attractive for you to provide some unique images um, you know that you can use and of course uh, the high resolution means that there are some people with high resolution bodies um, that you know like the new Nikon D850 or a, a Canon 5DSR or even if you're adapting it onto a you know one of the a Sony you know A7R series body that you're going to look at that and say I love the huge amount of resolution it's a good match for um, for the, the body that I'm using and again that may be a, a good option one final word for Sony shooters um, of course, Sigma, I think, has done a hugely smart thing by releasing the MC11 mount converter. And so you can throw Sigma lenses onto um, Sony E-mount bodies. And so upside is, of course, that you do have autofocus. And not just autofocus, but you have autofocus during video performance. Just a few notes on that. And that is with this particular lens, uh, it's not quite as seamless a performance as I've seen with some other Sigma lenses in that there is a bit of pulsing um, even in stills acquisition and it seems to lock on good and accurately but you know there there will be circumstances with the MC11 that you might see a bit of pulsing before it settles on lock the other thing is is that uh, for whatever reason while you do have video AF if you're using onboard audio expect to hear a fair bit of clicking um, just as the the lens adjust focus it clicks in a pretty noticeable way um, and so I wouldn't say that the autofocus motor here is perfectly tweaked for use with the MC11 during video capture seems to focus okay um, however it's 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 a noisy process so just note that as a potential limitation um, and so all in all uh, Sigma I think has managed to you know not just do something unique once again but they've done it in a very credible fashion and that this lens it works and while it's not best in the class and everything that it does it's really up near the top in pretty much all classes and of course it has class leading resolution and a class leading maximum aperture which makes it a pretty fantastic lens and so if you don't mind a little bit of heft and spending a little bit of money this may, may be the wide angle lens that you have been dreaming of oh and by the way be prepared to use add-on filters um, and if you're a Nikon shooter I, I talked about that add-on adapter it appears that that's only for Canon shooters um, at least right now and of course so you're going to need to get that adapter if you have a Canon body if you want to use the rear mount filters and of course or an aftermarket filter holder if you want to use uh, front filters on it you know always limitations with wide angle lenses that go this wide and have that bulbous front element but you know that is part of the consideration as well I'm Dustin Abbott and if you'll look in the description down below you can find both the link to my full written review a lot of information as a part of that on my website dustinabbott.net you can also find there an image gallery of the various images I've taken as a part of my review process and then of course you can find linkage there to follow me on social media become one of my patrons all of those things and of course if you haven't already please click that subscribe button thanks for watching have a great day